It's been uh, a pleasure and honor, so I'll start right away. Um, well, ending the global TB epidemic, it's uh, it's a big, uh, big uh, goal. Uh, but um, over the past several years, there have been uh, advances to keep uh, us hoping that something will come out of it, and hopefully, we'll uh, we'll be able to root out tuberculosis from um, uh, from a world. So um, briefly, I have uh, divided my presentation into global epidemiology of tuberculosis, latent TB infection, uh, my work in Tibetan and Himalayan children, um, and tools, strategies for detection and treatment of TB, some novel tools, and then summary and uh, future directions. So talking about tuberculosis, um, it's a personal uh, journey for me. Um, I grew up in India and I went to the Tibetan uh, refugee schools there. And when I was going, a lot of my friends, they developed TB. And when somebody developed TB, they had to stay out for months and months. And if, if a child develops drug-resistant TB, then you miss schools for two years. The treatment duration was long and many died. And personally, my grandfather developed uh, TB and died of it. Um, he, I came to know about it only when later on, my mom told me he developed a cough when he came from Tibet and then he was having fever and he, he was um, you know, coughing up blood. Nobody knew what, what it was at that time, but later on, you know, it was obvious it was tuberculosis. So um, in, the, in the schools and the environment that I grew up in, TB has really devastated the community. So those were some of the inspiration and the motivations that, that inspired me to take on this, uh, uh, this task. So um, briefly to go the, uh, discuss the vision, goal, and targets um, that the World Health Organization has set up for us. Um, so our vision is a world free of TB, zero TB deaths, zero TB disease, and zero TB suffering. And our goal is to end the global TB epidemic. And um, we have set several milestones. For example, for 2020, um, the WHO's NTB strategy, the percent reduction in number of TB deaths, we want to reduce it by 35%. And then reduction in incidence rate, we want to reduce it by 20%. And percent of TB affected households facing catastrophic cost due to TB, we want to cut it down to 0% all by 2020, 2020. And then we have separate set of targets for 2025, a mile, I mean, by 2025, 30 and 35. But let's look at 2020 because we just passed it. So what have we achieved any of these? Where, where do we stand? So we wanted to reduce the number of TB deaths by 35%. We managed to reduce it by reduce it by 9.2% as compared to 2015 baseline. And likewise, incidence rate, um, we managed to reduce by 11%. Um, likewise, catastrophic cost due to uh, TB, 47% uh, reduction as compared to what we hope to reduce. So we are really far away from, a long way from getting there, but we have made some progress. And now over these last two years, um, COVID-19 has really um, reversed a lot of progress that we have made. So a lot of work uh, that needs to be done. So in terms of TB uh, treatment and preventive therapy targets, um, I would largely focus on the TB preventive treatment targets because I'll be focusing a lot on TB prevention here. So we um, aim to treat uh, 30 million people with TB preventive therapy between 2018 and 2022. And we were able to treat only 8.7 million. Um, we did very well with people who are living with HIV. Uh, we wanted to treat 6 million and we treated 7.2 million. That was, that was great. And household contacts aged less than five years. Programmatically, everybody who is a contact less than five years should be getting TBT, but we managed to give it to only 1.2 million people as compared to um, 4 million that we aimed. And household contacts more than five years of age, so this part is really um, 
you know, we, we have achieved nothing at all, only 1.6%. So in terms of TB prevention, there is a huge, huge gap um, and uh, a need to scale up. So talking about TB eradication, elimination, and control. So I think it is important to uh, get some of these straight. Um, so TB elimination, or when we talk about ending the TB epidemic, we are trying to see 10 cases or less per million people. And then we talk about TB elimination, it would be one case per million people. And then TB eradication, zero TB infection and disease, uh, basically no TB on the face of the earth. So these are really ambitious targets. So when these targets were initially established during the high-level meeting of UN, it has been agreed on that we would need a technological breakthrough by 2025 to achieve the 17% reduction from 2025 through to 2035 so that we could get to this 10 case per million people. So, um, so that was... Um, so this, this will really happen only if we were able to substantially invest in R&D in the years up to 2025. So the new tools such as post-exposure or vac vaccines or a short efficacious and safe treatment for latent TB infection that could substantially lower the risk of developing TB among the approximately 1.7 billion or 2 billion people who are infected with latent TB infection. But right now, the way we are going, we are our annual decline in rate is 1.5%. And between uh, 2018 and 19, it has been 2.3%, which is far less than what we wanted to see. Right now, we wanted to see around 10% decline in TB every year to be able to achieve the targets. And from 2025, we wanted to see an accelerated decline of 17%. So the impact of COVID-19 on TB case no notification has been really uh, great. Uh, I mean, very um, significant and negative. So the global trend in TB case notification, as you see, from 2016 up until 2019, it has been going up on the left here, you can see. And then the pandemic happened, everything dropped. There was an 18% drop between 2019 and 2020 from 7.1 million to 5.8 million to the 2012 le level. So we have really reversed uh, back to 2012. And then um, if you look at this uh, global trends and the estimated number of deaths caused by TB and HIV for TB, you see that from 2019, there is this uptick here at the end. Likewise, TB deaths and HIV positive people, there's this uptick, right? So, so that's a, a, a big problem. The annual deaths from tuberculosis is uh, 1.3 million people versus from HIV, it's around 0.68 million people. And, COVID-19, we continue to see a decline in HIV deaths, but not for TB. We saw an uptick due to the COVID-19. So it could be largely due to the, the disturbance in systems, the TB contact tracing, everything that got all disturbed. And a lot of workforce has been, uh, has needed to be channeled into detecting COVID. So there's been a lot of, uh, but, but uh, many areas where we could learn from COVID as well. So this, this is a, um, the WHO's global TB report gives only uh, overall estimates, but uh, I looked into how the uh, TB case notification has um, done for specific populations such as vulnerable population like children. And in the Tibetan program in India, we assessed, um, you know, very quickly looked at the data and saw that in adults, uh, between the pre-pandemic and the pandemic era, the decline for in case notification in adults is 51%, but for children, it was 79%. So I'm right now analyzing the data for the district of Kangra, so we will have a better understanding using a, a bigger population for um, an entire district in India, and we'll see how the decline in notification has uh, differed based on specific populations based on vulnerabilities. So uh, this is the global TB incidence, as you see. Um, so only thing that I wanted to point out here is uh, that you know, we all see this, um, this, this pyramid here. Between age 15 to 24, and adolescents and young adults, it's a really a target, it's a population that should be targeted. Even during, in my work, we are seeing a lot of the TB cases when in children that are above 10 years of age and between 10 and 25. So that, that's a target population that, that's, 
um, an adolescent population is specifically a population that's that's being missed um, from diagnosis. So, um, and then globally, as we see um, annually, we are seeing 10 million new cases of TB um, that occur every year. Uh, but but a lot of it now not being notified or diagnosed. So this is um, this data on the right. That's what we saw in our children and adolescent population. It's very similar to the pyramid here, but except that here in this we have only up to age, age 23, 22 to 23. So it it should come you know could be should be compared accordingly with the global data here. So basically to say that a large number of TB cases we are finding, TB infection, this is TB infection, but we're seeing similar uh, prevalence in, in, uh, for TB disease as well in young, in adolescents and young adults. So the global epidemic of TB in children. So here, as you see, um, you know, of the 10 million people that get TB, Every year, around one and one and a half, one, around one and a half million are in children, and in adolescents. And overall, fifty-five percent of estimated children with TB are either missed from diagnosis or are not notified. And of the one point six million annual TB deaths, around a quarter million are in children. And globally, over seventy-five percent of um, child household contacts who are eligible for TPT do not access it. So, so based on this, and in, in we saw a similar problem in our community that we are working. So we developed the Zero TB in Kids project, specifically focused on detecting TB infection and disease in children and adolescents in schools and monasteries and nunneries. So briefly, um, uh, this is the work done by Huben and Dot. Um, showing the prevalence of latent TB infection by country. Um, so globally, as I said, 23%, uh, almost 2 billion of our people, they're infected with latent TB infection. So, uh, so the take on message is we cannot treat everybody with latent TPT. 2 billion people is just too much. So it is really important to target uh, populations, especially populations of high risk um, when we implement TPT. So here are the TB, TB preventive therapy coverage. I, I talked about this slide on the left before. So for children, um, 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 eligible children, let's say under five years of age who received TBT in 2007, if, if you look at India or Nepal, it's really between zero and 25, 24%. And, and the data are also lacking. So there is a need to um, scale up TPT. So basically, as I said, we have a global latent TB pool of 2 billion people, right? And then from these 2 billion people, we go on to develop active TB. So globally around, um, so that was that 6 to 10 million was, um, it, it should be around um, 6 to 7, it should be around um, 10. And uh, it was a, from a previous modeling. Um, and then there are, at each of these uh, reactivations, um, there are prevention steps or interventions that could be done. So we, from latent TB to uh, active TB, we want to give TB preventive therapy. And then from active TB, um, you know, then you treat them um, and they go on to be yeah, uninfected, but then again into the susceptible pool. And then they again get reinfection if the transmission is ongoing in the community. So there is this importance to have continued intervention so that at least there is no transmission happening once TPT. So this is one of the major challenges that we're facing when we implement TPT because it is not a vaccine. Or it, you know, People ask us often, if you take TPT, are we going to get TB again? Yes, you can if there is ongoing T, you know, TB. So, so th these are some of the challenges that are there in implementation. So I'm sure uh, you must all um, be familiar with this. In the past, we have seen TB as black and white, either it is latent TB or active TB, but now it is no longer, um, there is really uh, nothing latent about latent TB infection. It's, it's a continuum, it's a, a dynamic process, TB infection. So there is this active TB, subclinical TB, incipient TB, latent TB. So uh, this mycobacteria, they're constantly uh, moving between active and um, you know persistent phase, uh, so there's this constant activity happening. So uh, TB, uh, there is, uh, so it is really important to recognize these stages because when we screen people for TB these days, 
uh, especially with active case findings going on, a lot of people, they do not have symptoms. So when I go to the schools, you'll find a totally healthy kid, healthy looking kid, but their x-ray would have the lesion, right? So, so they, these people, they have either subclinical or incipient uh, TB. So they need to be treated because they're infectious. So that's the, the, the point of it. So, so again, this, uh, we discussed on that. So the, the point I wanted to make is uh, there's a huge uh, need. There's a huge gap. And uh, it is important to target which populations we want to screen. So populations like HIV positive, children less than five years of age who are contacts or household contacts or people who are living with in congregate settings like boarding schools, monasteries and nunneries where I do a lot of my work. And because uh, there is one TB case, an entire school and monastery, their contacts they interact every now and then in dining halls, prayer halls, studies, classrooms, um, and then dormitories, then migrants. So it is important to target. And then uh, based on the work that we have done, identifying recent TB infection, that's really important because we are even seeing that providing TPT is even more effective in people who had recent TB infection um, but needed to evaluate that further in, in larger data set. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my work. Uh, so tuberculosis in the uh, Tibetan population. So uh, Tibetan people have one of the highest rates of TB in the world globally. When they came into India, there was malnutrition, there was um, incompatibility with the environment, um, the refugee status, overcrowding, poverty, and a lot of factors coming together. And it was possible that back in Tibet, they were not exposed to TB. So it, it may be a new disease. So we, we never know. So, so what it led to is a lot of people, they developed uh, TB and they died of TB early on in the days, including my grandfather. So if, if you look at some of the data early in the 2012 to 16, um, tuberculosis in, in, in you know, uh, in the Tibetan population was almost comparable to what we saw in South Africa. And HIV was not a problem in this population versus South Africa where HIV was a major driving factor. So, so this is, for example, one of the, one of the dormitories that I, that I visited because there was an outbreak of multi-drug resistant TB here. It was a school in, in um, Northern India in Uttarakhand state. And I was a medical officer and running the TB program of Delhi Hospital at the time. And they called us because uh, many of the children got TB and worse, drug-resistant TB. And not just drug-resistant TB, most of them had quinolone-resistant drug pre-XDR TB. So that was really bad. And, and if you see this X-ray of this kid, um, this is an X-ray I, I produce. And when I look at that, I get a little sad because we could not save this girl. She was, uh, I think, around 14 or 15 years of age and very um, um, you know, sharp and intelligent girl. But unfortunately, she died. At that time, we do not have the new drugs of bedaquiline and delaminate that we have right now. If we had that at that time, we could have saved her. But we were fortunate enough to be able to save three other girls who had um, exactly the same drug-resistant TB with similar drug susceptibility pattern. And one of the girls, she had actually developed multidrug resistant TB with, she had lupus on top of it. So it was really complicated managing it. And we ended up reporting the first case of MDR TB in an SLA patient. But here, if you see basically what happened in this dormitory was that it was a cold region in the Himalayas and the windows were small. And this room that you saw, it's a box room where students all keep their clothes. So if somebody coughs in here, it's gonna linger and really spread. So these are some of the settings. And then we received a, a TB REACH grant from the Stop TB Partnership World Health Organization. So that really helped us understand the epidemiology of children, TB in children. We went from school to school, monastery to monastery. You see me here talking to a kid here back in the days. Uh, and then we went to monasteries. We tried to be in big halls where there is a lot of ventilation when we are screening people. And during those times, we went from Himachal Pradesh state to Uttarakhand, 
to uh, Karnataka from North India across to South India. And we saw, we found a very high rate of TB, uh, around 400 per 100,000. And in some of the monasteries, it was around 700 per 100,000. So it was really the first formal proper understanding that we have of the TB epidemiology. Um, and it was at that time on the active case finding because uh, we could not implement the latent TB. But then we have been doing TB case finding in this community for many years, but the TB rate was really not going down. It was just up there. It was just up there. And then if you look at this, this approach, this modeling, um, you see that um, if you treat active TB and active um, you know, case finding, it, it leads to decline in TB prevalence and incident, but, but really not that much. But if you treat both active and latent TB at number five, then, then you can see the, the decline that you really want to see to be able to end the epidemic. So that's really what we did. So we, when I came to Johns Hopkins as a postdoc, so that's when I decided to um, uh, work with my colleague and I worked with Dr. Chasen, who was my mentor and now a colleague, we developed this zero TB in Tibetan kids project. So it was a comprehensive mobile community-based screening and treatment program for both active and latent TB that brings TB care, both active and latent TB treatment to the doors of the schools and the monasteries. So this is the population. We went from North India to South India in three different states. Um, broadly, we did active case finding and treatment, uh, latent TB screening and preventive therapy. And then we were also making efforts in redu reducing the adult TB cases in the national program, all really hoping to communicate to TB elimination in children all under an umbrella of broad community mobilization, because it is really important to engage the community leaders, the partners, um, the, the, the members of the schools, the school leadership, the school nurses, dormitories, and everybody. Um, and TB is not just a problem that the medical fraternity can solve. The community members had to come in. Uh, this is the hospital where our uh, project was headquartered, is headquartered. And you see the Himalaya is really nice up there. And uh, this is the, the Dalda range, if you come to India in Dharamsala, I'll be happy to welcome you. Uh, this is the town of McLeod Ganj that I um, uh, very often visit. So here you see a number of these community mobilization activities. We even had children, you know, hold these kits and talk about discuss TB in front of other children. We had uh, videos, we had brochures, we met with the school mothers uh, and we had uh, training sessions with the school leaders. So that really all made a difference because everybody got involved and we got students from Johns Hopkins come and go to the schools in India and meet with the children because many a times the children, they will not tell us what, what they think. You know, they will tell that, oh, what do, we, what do you think about a zero TB program? They'll say all the great things, but they talk to the children, they talk to students. They say like, this is good, this is not good. So we learn many things about how to improve our program through these focus groups that a Hopkins student actually uh, were able to find out. So, so um, we'll briefly talk about a zero TB kids project here from 2017 to 2019, we enrolled. Now it has even gone further more than 7,000 people, including staff members and school children, or, or screened them over three years. Um, over the past two years, uh, the pandemic stalled our work, but now we have taken it up again. So, but here I'll discuss uh, first the results that we had from this screening between 2017 and 2019. So briefly, this is the workflow that we had. We screened for active TB using symptom criteria. You see our nurses here, they're asking the school children, do you have cough, fever, weight loss, chest pain, um, night sweats, um, uh, fatigue? Um, and then uh, if child is symptom positive, then um, you know, they can get an X-ray right away. If they are symptom negative, um, they still, um, you know, they, Regardless of symptom positive or symptom negative, they all children were um, getting tuberculin skin testing to see whether they had latent TB infection. And then after the screening of the nurses, they were seen by a doctor as well. And then uh, if somebody is tuberculin skin test positive with more than 10 mm, uh, they're getting chest X-ray to rule out active uh, disease before we provide TPT. There was a lot of concern of drug resistance. There's still a question, a research question there. Should we um, uh, skip X-ray and then straight away go to TPT in high burden areas or not? But, but 
there could be a lot of resistance from the community when we take that approach. So we were conservative and uh, careful. So for every child that is um, having latent TB infection, we did a chest X-ray. And it, it turned out to be really helpful because the chest X-ray in turn helped us identify a lot of subclinical tuberculosis. So, so this, uh, and then those who are negative for X-ray, but positive for uh, skin testing, latent TB, then they get preventive therapy and then with, with follow up. So this is the screening algorithm is essentially what I discussed in that uh, workflow earlier. Um, so it's, it's the same and these are all published. So this is again the workflow. Um, uh, um, and then these boxes that you see, we for each children, uh, we pack the TPT medicines and then the home mother would take care of it. For young children, they would supervise the therapy. And for older children, the, um, they, they could self-administer like children above 18. And then also staff members and uh, other adults living inside the school, they were all included in the project. Because many a times it is the adults who get TB and then transmit onto children versus the other way, which is also possible. But mostly we see uh, children getting TB from adults. So this is the, uh, the first uh, uh, initial results of our screening. And we found a very high prevalence of active disease to the tune of 838 per 100,000. And it was even higher in the boarding schools, above 900 per 100,000. And then TB infection rate was also very high. It was uh, one in five children had TB infection. So, so that, um, and then we continued with the program and we measured the three-year impact of a comprehensive screening and TPT uh, program. And these are the results that we, we have. So all between 2017 and 19, there were like 7,368 um, children who were screened uh, of which majority were students more than 6,500. And then there were around 814 staff members. Um, so uh, the distribution between males and females were pretty uh, similar, and uh, the the average median age of children were 13 years of age. It was really the 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 the, the period. And then the prevalence of hepatitis B was um, high, so that that was a problem because um, there was the scare of hepatotoxicity, and there was a lot of um, in the past TPT implementations. Uh, one of the biggest barrier has been hepatotoxicity. Uh, or the rumor of it. People people just worry right away. But we really didn't see that much of hepatotoxicity, much less than 1%. So, uh, so that really reassured us that uh, we can move forward with a program at a large scale. Um, you know, it was important that we screen people right away from the beginning if they have acute liver disease, then we avoided providing um, isoniazid or rifampin, which were the, the therapy that we were using. And then if you see here, the prevalence of TB infection, or no, the prevalence of past TB was really high um, in, the, in, the, in the staff members, almost 18% had TB in the past. So it, it reflects on the, on the exposure and the prevalence in the community itself. And then children, uh, it was 3%, we were still high. And exposure to TB in the past two years for all participants, 26% were exposed to TB. And for students, it was 28% and staff, it was 30. Um, and then the exposure was mostly happening at school because it was a boarding school. And uh, um, so it's understandable, but there were exposure happening at home as well when children go to vacations. And many children, they're, they're orphans or semi-orphans. So they their home is the school. So they just live in the dormitories and stu school takes care of them. So but there's a lot of interest right now in the sex distribution. We are seeing globally that uh, tuberculosis is uh, a greater prevalence of TB in male versus female population. It is a biological phenomenon that is currently being studied. And in our population, if you see here, you know, we saw that age-wise prevalence of TB infection in children is higher in, in males as compared to females. The, the, TB disease rate also um, we're finding somewhat higher. If you see this children age between 17 and 18 is higher in males versus female. The, I think the, the, the graph on the left is representative because the sample is greater. It talks about the TB um, the, the, uh, results of the TB infection. So this is the uptake of TPT. In total, um, we found 
1700, uh, around 1733 people with latent TB infection. It was a very good uptake rate that we saw uh, thanks to the community mobilization and awareness and education the way we were able to provide. And those who could not receive TPT was people who had chronic hepatitis B or liver disease or who, who were taking uh, drugs for other regions with potential drug-drug interactions or, or very old people um, um, who are staying in the, in the uh, monasteries uh, and then people with comorbidities where the medical officer was not feeling comfortable providing TPT. So this is the TB care cascade. Um, this is the, uh, sorry, this is the TB care cascade that we, we had. Um, um, so essentially it, it discusses um, everything that I have um, showed before. This is the TB care cascade. Basically, um, we went from screening children and adolescents. We identified poor people who are eligible for TB screening. We excluded those who had past TB because um, they were giving TST for people who had past TB, they could be still reactive. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then um, people who screened for TB infection, uh, we identified people who refused TB and then um, refused uh, TB infection screening. There were children who were scared or who just didn't want to, or parents didn't give consent um, permission. And then, um, and then we measured the TPT uptake. So really improving the care at each of these cascades is important in terms of um, uh, achieving the NTB targets. So this is the TPT outcome among school children and staff members. Uh, so a lot of people, almost 87% um, completed TPT. And uh, the completion rate, we use two different regimens. One is three months of isoniazid and rifampin, and one is four months of rifampin. Um, both were WHO approved. Um, and these two different regimens were used because initially we used 3HR, and then we saw some side effects in the older children. And, um, and then we had an internal discussion. Our study team decided to go forward with four months of rifampin. And we really saw fewer side effects with four months of rifampin. And the tolerance and completion rates were fine. So the uh, and then at the time, at this time of publication, a lot of uh, the therapies were ongoing. But essentially to say, we had a very good completion rate. So this is the results overall for all children all participants, school students, and staff members. Um, there were uh, almost 14,958 person years of follow-up. 71 people developed TB disease at an incidence rate of 475 per 100,000. And those who had no TPT, when they were compared to people who received TPT, we saw that those who uh, received TPT had 80% uh, lower hazard of uh, active disease as compared to people who did not receive TPT. Uh, you have a very significant p-value of um, uh, uh, so so this is the results in children and adolescents. Very similar results. Um, you see that comparing children who did not receive TPT and comparing children who did receive TPT. Children who did not receive um, did receive TPT at almost eighty percent lower risk of developing active disease over the three years of follow up, and uh, we particularly saw that those who had recent contacts, those who were exposed to TB recently, uh, they had almost ninety three percent lower risk of developing active TB. So it's it's it, 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 the rationale for contact tracing and screening people or TPT implementation in those with recent TB contacts. So this is um, the cap, uh, the survival curve uh, uh, that, that it was published in the PLOS Medicine. And then we looked at the year-wise incidence of active TB in school children. Um, and uh, you will see here that in 2017, we saw an incidence rate, as I said before, a very high incidence of 838. And then in 2018, it declined to 439. 2019, further declined to 139 per 100,000. Uh, likewise, prevalence of TB infection, it went down from nearly 20% in 2017 to 11% in 2019. So this is the drop that we saw in the school children um, in, in, in incidence um, uh, over the years. So this is the drop that is just a um, different representation, uh, but basically drop in the prevalence of TB infection. 
So now I'm looking, this, this is unpublished data, I'm still analyzing the data. So we are looking at five-year impact of a comprehensive screening and TPT. Over these past two years, we were really not able to carry out any screening between 2020 and 2021. Everything got installed, the stalled uh, TB uh, team on the ground, they had to be mobilized and they were on the uh, frontline workers for COVID. Uh, so we couldn't do really anything. So we were concerned and, um, so, so this year only we were able to restart tuberculosis screening. Um, and in and, and restarting, we continued to see, a, 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 it, it went up from 2110 to 129, but really uh, you know, the impact has remained. Um, TB infection um, prevalence among the school children that we screened, we screened around 3000 children this year again, uh, so these these are data that needs to be further analyzed, compiling everything. But uh, we're continuing to see a lower prevalence. And importantly, there are uh, three TB cases that developed in the children. They were from one of the schools where we could not implement a TPT program. It was in a school that was bordering Shimla. Um, we did not implement TPT there. We did not were not able to screen there because of the distance. So so. If that school was excluded, then um, um, then it, it the, you, this is the drop that that we see. You know, uh, in 2022, the the reduction in TB incidence compared to 2017 was more than 90 percent, which is really um, heartwarming and uh, heartening and encouraging. So it it shows that uh, having doing this comprehensive screening and then um, can have a long term impact. But but these are not these data are not final. Very preliminary analysis and uh, currently being worked on. But we saw we also screened monasteries uh, at the same time this year as well. We screened around five hundred forty one monks and nuns this year in India, and we in eighty. 186 had TB infection because we were not able to implement much of a screening in the monasteries. We were more focused on schools. And you here you see the rate of infection uh, much higher. But one one reason is that the is, there are many older monks as well. So that that could be a reason. Uh, but still, um, the TB disease rate is also much higher at 554 per hundred thousand. But but then we should remember that the data the the. The sample is not that big, so sometimes outbreak in one or two of the monasteries or one or two of the schools could really um, you know, bring up the, the rates. But nevertheless, uh, comprehensive packages and comprehensive screening works. This was an experience back in Peru in the days uh, where they were able to reduce uh, TB prevalence from more than 2,500 to 2,300 through um, community-wide programs, screening and chemoprophylaxis with latent TB. Uh, so this was another TB screening uh, implementation uh, and that, that, that worked. So, so some of the takeaways, so population level TPT implementation can be successful and it can greatly reduce TB incidence in high burden settings and preventive therapy is implementable on a population level. And these newer short course regimens of 3SP and 1SP, um, um, they may greatly increase the uptake and uh, community mobilization is important. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the newer diagnostics for detecting latent TB infection and TB disease. So here in the, in the past, if you see this quantifieron gold plus, um, you know, this is something that is not implementable on a lab in a remote area. And it's a lot of tech, sophisticated technology, but now the Kaijin has come up with Kaya Reach. If you see this, this laptop and this, um, this uh, portable device, it's Kaya Reach. And we were able to install it in our lab in India. And we are now uh, currently carrying out an active study. And this is an IAGRA based test um, and, um, and working really in a, in a um, resource limited setting. We did not need that sophisticated technology. So, uh, so tuberculin skin testing has its own limitations. So now we are in an ongoing study, uh, we are assessing whether um, the concordance between TST and uh, Kaya Reach. So these results are, this study is still ongoing and we'll have the results very soon. But, but essentially to say that this, this has changed a lot of the work because with tuberculin skin testing, there has to be two uh, encounters with the participant. First, to 
uh, first to give the tuberculin skin testing. And then after 48 to 72 hours, we need to go back and then read the TSD versus with this, just one encounter, you take one ml of blood and that's it. Um, and then you get the results. So it really brings down the cost and time and resources. So this is another newer diagnostics, the CTB test for uh, uh, TB infection uh, that was developed by the Serum Institute. So this, this again is uh, uh, really uh, promising. We, we have not yet used it, but essentially it's a IGRA-based skin test. Uh, and we, we are hoping that we could uh, implement TST versus skin CTB as well um, in, in our population. So basically it should have higher specificity as compared to TST. So this is the work TB transmission that, that I'm currently doing as a part of my K, K grant from NIH. So a lot of under, trying to understand how TB transmission is happening. Uh, in the past, we believe that most of the transmission are happening in household contacts, right? But really now the, the, the idea has changed. Uh, a number of studies have shown that it's not just the household contacts, really a lot of social transmission is happening. So transmission such as uh, in public transport or in schools or monasteries and in such areas. So it is important to not just go out, uh, screening households is really important, but then also it is equally important to screen the community, to, to take the approach to the community. It's something that we're currently doing, we're doing a molecular um, epidemiology study in TB transmission dynamics using social network analysis, whole genome sequencing in spatial epidemiology. A lot of work uh, uh, got squalled over the pandemic, but we are now um, up taking it up again uh, in India and hoping to do similar work in Nepal as well. So, um, so if you see this, um, you'll see that here uh, we have, um, you know, two billion people with latent TB infection, right? So. Um, and then out of this, so a uh, few people develop active TB. So finding that active TB, so that is really important. I, I talked about this before, uh, how to go about that. So this is a blood transcriptomic uh, stratification of short-term skin rays and context of TB. So there is interest in this. Um, uh, there have been RNA transcripts that have been found to have predictive ability to, ability to predict TB disease progression in specific populations. So again, this is uh, several studies done and specific transcripts um, uh, have been shown to have a higher um, um, ability to predict TB, but then a lot of research work that is happening. So hopefully um, uh, we'll have uh, tools that could help us understand which of the people with latent TB infection go on to develop active disease so we can really intervene and we can be very efficient in terms of targeting our screening and interventions. So this is another thing. When gene export came along back in the days, uh, in the past, when I was treating, when I was medical officer, we had like almost 200, 300 TB cases every year. And of that, there are four around uh, more, a lot of cultures would need to be done and each culture would come back after around two to three months. So the moment we start to treat a person with drug susceptible TB, that person may have been drug resistant TB, but then the cultural result would come back only after three months. So after three months, the drug resistance may have further progress. And then gene export came along and really changed our you know, you know, lives because uh, now we could right away find whether um, uh, somebody is having um, drug resistant TB or not, basically rifampin resistant TB or not, right? So likewise, when we were doing a zero TB kids screening, one of the major challenges that we faced was x-rays. We had to take children out of the schools to a town and then get x-rays and then the responsibility, arranging the buses and then getting the results back, uh, the reports, it was such a nightmare. It was so complicated. And then with support from TB Reach, we managed to get this Fuji's uh, ultra portable digital X-ray that was equipped with artificial intelligence. So you see it was only three kilos and you can just take it in a backpack. It's in the, in the school in India that we were doing the study, a nurse is taking X-ray. It became so convenient. Children do not have to go outside the school campus and everybody liked it. It was not just for TB. We could even do the X-ray of a person with, uh, with, with, uh, with problems with his bone and he, he, he had a trauma. So, so it's very useful. And then you can see the, the quality of the image. It was just fabulous, superb. And, um, and then if you, if you look at this box here, 
This is the artificial intelligence box. So what it does is it, uh, I, I don't know if I, I didn't have the image here. It, it gives a score and it gives a TB score. So right now we are doing a study in children whether a TB prediction by AI is uh, similar to TB prediction by doctors. So the doctors are essentially blinded to the AI score. And then we are currently assessing it. So this is an ongoing study happening. So this is another, these are the, the expert platform that I was talking about. This, this is the first expert that we installed back, you know, back in 2000, I think 11 or 12, uh, when we ran the TB reach. Now we have the expert XDR. Um, so that is, uh, that is again, changing a lot of the dynamics and really helping. So in another thing, this is a newer um, true lab essay. It's a chip-based um, essay for um, micro, uh, PCR analyzer for diagnosis of TB. So currently comparing expert versus um, this uh, true lab technology. The good thing about this true lab is that you can take it to the field. Expert, it is difficult because it needs to be connected to uh, electricity, but this true lab has battery powered and good storage. So it can, uh, you can, uh, you do not need to be connected to electricity for an entire day and then run a uh, test um, on this platform. So there are likewise urine lamb. I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Uh, so, uh, so, and just cannot skip this because recently we have the Shine TV regimen that came out. So there is a lot of uh, good things happening. Tuberculosis, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, achievements in the history of TB treatment. Uh, so far, the treatment of TB has been six months. Now we have a TB treatment regimen that is four months. So that is really highly promising. It's been published in New England. The conclusion is that four months of anti-TB treatment was non-inferior to six months of TB treatment in children with drug-susceptible, non-severe smear-negative tuberculosis. So this is another study that we are currently hoping to undertake as a part of our project in India and Nepal. And then this is Dr. George Comstock at Johns Hopkins, uh, um, who initially um, found out that IPT was working. It was really one of the key studies back in the days in Alaska that, that um, it changed how we look at TB treatment and TB, TB prevention specifically. And we, uh, the TB rates in Alaska at that time was extremely high. And uh, with this IPT, able to reduce the, the, the rates. Um, and then uh, we have now these newer regimens with uh, three uh, weekly isonized and rifapentin. So, and then further on, uh, so this is several studies have shown that the three months of isonized and rifapentin is working. Um, and uh, this is the three months of IS IPT working. And uh, this is, uh, so recently in the brief uh, TB study, uh, we were able to, uh, our colleagues in Hopkins, they were able to show that one month of is I, you know, isoniazid and rifapentin is just as effective. So this is the study based on this study in uh, mouse models by Eric, who's a colleague here at Hopkins. So basically now we have a regimen that, that can be given for one month and that works in preventing uh, TB. So, so there is a lot of hope there as well. But how low can we go? We have come down from 12 months to nine months to six months to one month. And now in, in mouse models, um, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Eric Neumberger, he has seen that one month, uh, one single dose of bedaquiline is effective in preventing Bedaquiline injection is effective in preventing um, TB in mouse models. So there's, there's, if, if we could prevent TB in, with one injection, so that, that's really cool. And that, that, would, that would change a lot of things. So, so this is currently something that's is being studied. I'm not going to talk much about vaccines, but there is still some hope, but I believe that there is still a long way for vaccines to go. So this is the first trial that showed that uh, we can probably have some some um, hope in, in, in vaccines um, apart from BCG. So, so the epidemiological impact of scaling up uh, TB inter intervention in Southeast Asia, because a lot of TB we're seeing in Southeast Asia, if you see that, if you strengthen the health systems, the decline in TB incidence and the decline in TB rate. And then what happens if you accelerate TB case detection? Uh, so this is the detection. This is a modeling that was done here. And uh, you see that uh, TB um, the incidence and mortality decline is uh, much greater. 
And then if you add TPT, so this is really where you can get that NTB targets. So there is really no excuse and we uh, implementing TPT is important um, as a part of national programs. So right now we are now, I'm now working really hard on scaling up a work in Nepal in zero TB Himalayas project that we, we've just submitted a protocol to the Nepal's uh, Central um, Ethics Authority and hoping that it'll get it approved soon. So there we're planning to screen um, schools, monasteries and nunneries um, across Nepal, starting with Kumbu and uh, Kathmandu. So there's, uh, I have personal interest in understanding how altitude um, affects uh, development of TB disease. So that's why, and then also uh, there's a lot of mountain people like this kid, I took this picture, he was this 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 animal is a mix of yak and a a cow. It's very good with uh, with mountains and taking loads. So this child was helping his dad uh, uh, take this animal to to a fair where they are trying to sell this animal, right? But but then you know, the child had to take this animal for hours and hours just to get up to Namche Bazaar to that fair. So there is a lot of challenges happening up in the mountains that we do not know about. One thing that I was, uh, is, uh, I met this woman and um, she, she had classical symptoms of TB, if you see this woman there, uh, but she was still not getting care. And then the, uh, at Lukla hospital, at not, I stayed at a place in Lukla and I was having a chat with this woman. And she said during this COVID-19 pandemic, when people died, people got so scared. They didn't know what to do because the only means of transport could be helicopters. And that was really very, very expensive. And then you have to, um, the army was helpful, but then there was so much that army can do. And getting people literally carrying them on these terrains to a place where they can get healthcare, that's really difficult. And so what they did, there were a lot of rumors spread. And I'm sure that this is a rumor that you haven't heard, but basically almost every household, almost every person in Lukla, they drank tadpole soup during the COVID-19 pandemic to, to prevent, because it's a rumor that, that spread. So, so this is, uh, Dr. Sadeev, you were talking about the Lukla hospital. So this is the Lukla hospital there. I was really encouraged to see that they have a gene expert there. So, so, uh, so hoping that we are carrying on the work and I hope to see you in Nepal. Um, so this is the funding gap. This is quite uh, discouraging, but then we have come a long way from um, much worse situations and now things are starting to improve. Johns Hopkins TB Center has just received a smart for TB $200 million grant from the USAID. So hopefully uh, it'll, it'll let us do a lot of good work in uh, controlling TB globally. Uh, so as I said, there is really no, no, no excuse. Uh, so this is this is an X-ray that I took from a museum in, in Nepal recently. So this is where the Fuji film has come up, uh, uh, come from. You see this. This is back in the days how X-rays got taken, and this is what we have now. So so there is much to hope for, and um, and then I'm very grateful to a lot of people. It's a effort by so many people. The work that we have done, including uh, Dr. Jason Ballinger, Dr. Pastor. Um, uh, and many other people at Hopkins and then my colleagues at Dalek Hospital and then the funders who have supported the work so uh, passionately and um, sincerely over many years. So thank you everyone and uh, thank you all.